right. Uh, our first panelist is Rhonda Holburton. She is an artist and associate professor of digital media. Rhonda holds a MFA from Stanford and a BFA from California College of the Arts. Her multimedia installations make use of digital and interactive technologies integrated into traditional methods of art production. Her art is included in the collection of SF MoMA and the McAvoy Family Foundation and has been exhibited globally. Her interdisciplinary art practice illuminates the politics of the corporeal body, navigating through virtual space. Recent projects utilize networked VR designed to trigger subtle interactions of electrons between biological and digital systems through Reiki, and I may be saying that wrong, so you have to correct me, a speculative cosmetic company that whose mission is focused on the potential of products to create distributive performative action, ritualizing the Anthropocene. Thank you for joining us today. Rhonda. Hi, thanks for the great intro. Really excited about the panel today. Tony Parisi is a metaverse pioneer, former VP of Unity Technologies. Tony Prezi, uh, yep. he's also a virtual reality pioneer, serial entrepreneur, investor, and musician. He is the co-creator of 3D graphic standards, including VRML, X3D, and GITF. Tony is the author of a number of O'Reilly Media's books on virtual reality and WebGL. He is also a leading spokesperson for the immersive industry, speaking on industry trends and technology innovations at numerous industry conferences. He was recently named Next Reality's 30 People to Watch in Augmented Reality in 2020, and most recently, Tony was head of XR Ads and e-commerce at Unity, where he oversaw strategy and product for the company's real-time 3D brand advertising and commerce solutions. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Christina and team. John, great to see you. Eddie, here we are again. One more time. Um, our next panelist is Christopher Lafayette. He's an emergent, emergent technologist and founder of Gatherverse. Christopher is an emergent technologist in virtual and augmented reality, applying his talents to med tech, education, fintech, and applied sciences. He is working for a more equitable culture and technology and serving as a Silicon Valley national and international speaker, thought leader, and an advocate for greater expansion of community in technology. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, everyone. Ed Mason is founder and CEO of Curve Reality, develop, Curve Reality, who, developers of the first Web3 games console. Ed is a pioneer in XR and emerging technology and has built products and prototypes for NVIDIA, Mattel, and Samsung. Ed is currently a metaverse architect working out the next generation metaverse with a team from PlayStation Home. Welcome, Ed. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming today. So I wanted to start off with just kind of like a introductory question where you tell us a little bit about your experience with NFTs right now, and maybe imagine how you would be working with NFTs in the next two to three years. And, you know, I'll start, I'm, I'll, anyone can start. I'll start with Rhonda since she's first on my screen. Yeah. Um, so I'm a digital artist. So thinking a lot about this, this question to mint or not to mint and, um, right now I'm mint curious, so, uh, I'll be, <laughs> uh, I'll be working on an exhibition this, this summer, but I think in order to reconcile the minting, I, the contract, the smart contract would necessarily need to address some of, some of the accessibility issues and some of the environmental issues. So that would have to be built into the piece in some kind of some capacity. I'm working with Christina and the folks at the library on uh, a project uh, outside of my own studio practice that is, seeks to create a multi-generational digital stewardship center uh, at San Jose State with some public partners. Uh, and I think one of the more interesting questions that NFTs raise are, are that of digital stewardship, right? So if you don't, as John mentioned in his introduction, like own the object or you don't have the copyright, you, you are a steward you, of, this, of this object and those that created it. And so what does that mean? So I think it's really opened up some interesting questions around collective ownership and, and stewardship of, of digital objects. Great, thank you. Tony, did you wanna share that? that answer that same question about yourself? Oh yeah, I've been on a journey for about a year since the NFT stuff started hit everyone's consciousness. I was very skeptical originally, uh, not just because of the big hype around the people sale and all that, but 
you know, as I started unpacking it, I realized, well, this isn't really copy protection. It's not protecting the digital assets at all. You're, you're just getting a certificate to something that could be, you know, right click saved as and, and spread around everywhere. So what was the point sort of things where I started? I wrote a rant on my Medium blog called The Treachery of Ownership which referenced the um, Magritte pipe and sort of went deep into this whole you know, side of it. And um, so that's where I started about a year ago on this. And then over time, I've warmed up to it. And, and I've actually been seeing what's going on with NFTs outside of the collection craze, you know, the apes and all these sort of wild collectibles and speculation, which is its own set of issues. The power of the smart contracts and uh, the economic abilities this is unlocking for artists. I myself am a musician, so I started really kind of taking this seriously about how I was going to monetize my own music projects. I was thinking about going on Spotify and, and basically spending more money uh, just trying to build an audience there. And I was like, what is the point of this? So I started following a bunch of musicians. And it turns out the independent musicians coming around now are really doing some amazing things. And, you know, I don't want to go deep into it here. Maybe we can unpack it in the course of the panel. But, you know, there's different business models that are being unleashed uh, for artists who have had a, a pretty rough go of it. When you look at the music industry in particular, basically they've been screwed for 20 years. Um, and they're looking at the age, if you're old enough to remember the age of the uh, big music labels, a very abusive industry in itself as the golden age of things when they used to like give the artists in advance pay to make the records, pay to put them on tour, you know, and then pay them a gracious 10% on the back end. But, you know, they were surviving along the way. So, you know, the pandemic sort of stuck a dagger into everything that was already going on with streaming services and file sharing before that. So I've really warmed up to this. I myself have minted once now on the Polygon chain, so much more environmentally friendly. And I'll, I know we're going to talk about the environmental aspects. And that was just an experiment on OpenSea. Okay, what does the process look like uh, for some of my own amateur visual art? I took, you know, I spent my five bucks about Procreate and I started making my own little abstracts and I've got a couple other series I will launch. But, you know, I'm not going to do those until I understand more about the dynamics of these blockchains and whether Ethereum is really going to go to ETH2 and become environment friendly and all that. So uh, amateur mentor, big supporter of the music industry moving in this direction. I would love to elaborate more on what I think those models might be. So I'm now all in and bullish on NFTs with some of this nuance that I just mentioned. Yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll get into a lot of that during the panel. So Christopher, did you want to answer that question about yourself also? Um, so how have you personally interacted with NFTs right now? And how do you imagine yourself doing so in two to three years? Sure. And um, it's a great question to kick off. So for me, uh, we launched the first hip hop NFT platform called Hip Hop Coins years ago. And it's in fact, I was just sitting here staring at John, which is interesting because I've known John for some years now here from the Valley. And we used to study this in Hacker Dojo when John was doing a lot of doing his leadership with SVVR and doing some cool things with that. And Tony knows about that too. And so we're Hacker Dojo. We we're studying crypto assets, NFTs. And for me, as I've been talking for some time now, and I know a lot of people in my industry have kind of kicked back against me on this. And I'm, I'm actually glad to hear what Tony just expressed because I, I feel like people are kind of warming up to it now. Um, I've seen the value in it for so long, but I would say not from what the craze is of the Beeple craze, but really from the nat native aspect of it. You know, this goes back, a lot of people think, oh, NFTs, crypto assets are all new. It's not new, it's emerging. And there are people that have built this with intention behind it. And what happens is that once it gets in the hands of marketers, it kind of turns into a whole different thing and almost bastardizes the intention nativity of the technology itself. So if we go back to like BitDNS, I gave a whole talk on this last year. Beat, beat DNS all the way back to 2011, right? This is when you first started to see NFTs come to scene. And then you got um, Counterparty, Color Coins, Ethereum, 2015. That's where you have Ethereum. And that's when their first big major conferences are like, hey, here's a tile NFT. And people are like, well, what are these? And if they would have known the value of it is, just like they would have known about, if they would have known what Bitcoin was, I mean, I can remember even Hacker Dojo, there's just, Bitcoin machines that's just sitting in there collecting dust. And it's like, don't put your money into that. And it's like, my goodness gracious, I passed a billion dollars every time I walked in the doors. And so when you think about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, it's gone through the standard processes, 720 ERC, 1155 ERC. So it's gone through this progressive scale. And so for me, 
and with us and coming out of the in music industry, similar to Tony, uh, I know he's done amazing things for what I've heard in the music space, which is also in Berkeley, I believe. And, and so for me coming in the music industry, looking at the st stepping over treacherous landmines, if you will, one of the things that come to mind is artist preservation and sustainability. So for me, where I'm coming at when it comes to NFTs is about human sustainability, how we look at it, a human centricity, how it builds and binds and brings communities together. Um, there are a lot of bit things that are bad with it. The environmentally, as the intro said, which I thought was fantastic. <clears throat> and then really kind of, and we'll <clears throat> chop wood on it, but really getting into the, how do you, how do you, centralized community in the singular metaverse not metaverses everyone i just had to throw that one out there because some people there's no it's singular metaverses tony go look at his rules but if you look at nfts what relationship do they have ecologically with the metaverse xr spatial community whatever we want to call it what relationship does it have to human centricity education accessibility community development, wellness, equality, safety, privacy. Those are the standards that I'm interested in. And those are some of the things we're having discussions and talks about today when it comes to Gatherverse. Thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point that it's not new that it's emerging and it actually has been. We've been working towards this point for a long time, right? So I think that that's a new idea for some people too because just so recently it's been in the media. Oh, great. Ed, do you want to share that those same answers with us about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I've been in the NFT space since uh, February of 2021. Um, started off in a project called Rare Pizzas uh, that taught me a great deal about the space. Um, I see NFTs effectively as a technology, as the next iteration of the internet, if you will, in a way that you can now bring together a community of individuals to do something under a noble cause in a way that was never before possible. Um, with the pizza dough or rare pizzas, it was a great example of this. The idea was to sell a collection of NFTs to put 51% of the proceeds towards buying pizza for people all over the world. And on May 22nd, actually held the world's largest pizza party. Uh, this is sort of um, hundreds of thousands of dollars that shared uh, across 60, uh, 60 odd countries, I think over five continents, where a lot of people, a lot of hungry people managed to eat free pizza for the day. So this taught me a great deal about how this technology could be used in new and innovative ways. To be able to get thousands of people to, to congregate together and to work under a communal task is something I've never seen before, something that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do unless you forked out an obscene amount of money to hire a lot of individuals. But now we have a lot of forward thinking people who understand the technology and can see what it can bring about that is unlike anything I've seen before. And that led me to Frogland, of course, with this, this, this notion of a, a metaverse uh, that we're building with some very skillful people um, in, the, in the space as a way that we can disrupt the traditional method of content creation. Uh, how can you build with a community rather than building with the sort of investors who may not actually take the time or the, the patience to play the product that you're building? So to me, this was a, a new age in computing itself. And I've been in the emerging tech space for quite some time. It's great to see some, some friendly faces I've known since probably about 2013, 2014, uh, when my company's built the first self-contained virtual reality headsets. So this has been a new way, I think, of generating funding, a new way of building community, and ultimately a new way of creating in a more transparent capacity that I've never had the chance of witnessing before. And so I am very bullish on NFTs. There are definitely things that need to improve, uh, but ultimately this is nascent technology. This is emerging. This is not a completed thing yet. So I'm looking forward to the days that we do get more envir environmentally friendly blockchains out there. There are layer two solutions already out in the open, uh, but we can dig into that a little bit later on. Great. Thank you so much. And Ed, I just want to shut up an extra note of appreciation because he's in the UK. So it's like two o'clock in the morning for him. And I, I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us. So right, right. get the not long not distance not award. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for having me, John. Great. So I think I wanted to start off with this, with this question to this panel, which is like our artists and creators panel specifically, which is, what do you see that the greatest impact NFTs will potentially have on more traditional media creators or digital media artists that may be hesitant to get into the space? And, and maybe what are the barriers for them? And some of those are going to be, you know, ethical and technical and socioeconomic but what do you think that impact will be to more traditional media creators um, and how could they overcome some of those barriers if they decide to? I'm happy to you know, speak to that. So um, on the one hand, a lot of folks who are not, you know, going through MFA programs or, you know, kind of 
university education programs that can be gate holders. And I think we have to talk a lot about gate holders and what we mean when we say gate holding. Um, in, in academia, when you have a peer reviewed journal, does the journal benefit from that gatekeeping? <laughs> you know, there, there's questions around that. Um, so I think we have to also unpack what we mean when we say institution, right? Like what are the institutions that are gatekeepers for access into kind of making money off of your art? Um, traditionally, those have been, you know, the museums and gallery systems. Um, as Tony kind of alluded to, when we got rid of a lot of those management systems in the digital music industry, the, the musicians didn't necessarily benefit, right? What's, what you create is a, a system that, you know, gives artists direct access, direct access to the, the public, but then it's massively distributed. You become a, a person who needs to wear four hats do four jobs instead of, you know, having the manager and the distributor and, you know, so I think these kind of bell curve distributions of labor that distribute capital um, in across a broader section uh, for more people can be seen as a good thing. And I think we're seeing the re repercussions globally of an economic system that has kind of sucked a lot of your bu bureaucracy or labor of bureaucracy out of the system and kind of, you know, atomized the, the capital around certain servers, <laughs> you know? So, so is that a good thing? Is the gatekeeping, does, is that actually a good thing? Does it actually create like a, a you know, a middle class uh, full of people who are creative adjacent and creative supporters, but maybe not the creators themselves. Um, access to institutions, the institutions themselves, and let's look at the institutions historically are very biased, have a ton of, of unjust systems uh, within them um, historically have benefited a colonial class. Um, and so I think we need to talk a lot about, you know, where these institutions inherited their wealth in the first place or, or, or you know, accumulate their, their wealth in the first place to support the, the artists that they are supporting. Um, I attended a panel actually just before this, some digital media curators and artists kind of thinking about ways to rethink the institution um, and a large part of that conversation is coming out of pressures of the, the NFT market. So, um, and I'll kind of talk about the, the artist access, access point, you know, from an artist perspective as well. Um, I think it's opening, you know, a lot of people can make, you know, uh, cute drawings and make money off of them. Is that a good thing? Is that like a net good? I, I don't think it's, you know, the, the drawings themselves are, are necessarily a problem, but is this something that we want to kind of use our energy resources to, to you know, produce? Are there other ways that the, this, this can happen? I think that there are lots of ways that this can happen. On the flip side, um, Steve, not Steve Deeds, Oh, I'm forgetting his last name. He runs Bitforms Gallery, who has been a massive supporter of digital arts from the very early, early days. Um, was talking, he has a show or had a show in San Francisco and sold a, an edition of five. The last edition sold for $150,000 in an NFT format of a work that he couldn't sell <laughs> as a digitally native kind of object for you know $6,000. So, so is that a good thing? Yes, for that artist and yes, for Steve, but, you know, there's a long tail, you know, that is not true. That is not most artist experience uh, of the NFT world. So I think that it's easy to kind of hold a few examples up and say, see, an artist has made some money. Um, but for, for most people, I think it could potentially the kind of vacuum created uh, if you remove these cultural institutions um, might be more harmful than, than good. I think there's a lot of threads to pull on and what Rhonda just said, actually. Um, I'm not sure the different art forms are going to follow the same trajectories either. I mean, when you look at the visual arts, that is a much more uh, historically, um, it's a much more structured system in a sense. And that gallerist and curatorial function uh, is strong and maybe necessary is what you're hinting. Or, you know, we, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater on that one. I think it's a little bit different in popular music, uh, which is a much more mass market sort of thing for, for whatever that's worth. And so I think the dynamics might be different and some of the stuff I'm seeing anecdotally. So basically what I did is I just started following a lot of music NFT accounts on Twitter, 
then I started making friends online, and then I started going to Twitter spaces and discords with them, and you start hearing their stories. And I asked some of them point blank, how are you doing this? Because they were coming up with really complicated NFT strategies. And, and to Rhonda's other point, they're getting service providers to help them. They're kind of being, they're becoming their own little record label. They're doing everything. <laughs> they're paying programmers to write smart contracts because they're doing something really elaborate. Literally, that's what they're, I asked this woman, Violetta, I was like, that doesn't sound like something you can put on Royal where you just put up the MP3 and a piece of artwork. How did you do that? She said, I paid a coder. Um, so in that case with music, I think you may see the artists continue to be their own teams or, you know, re reform teams. The difference, though, between that and doing it on the streaming services there is they actually are going to make money doing it, at least early returns. Like you said, Rhonda, who knows? You can point to a couple of specific examples. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to popular art forms, you may see like lots of thousands of communities of artists, you know, based. Each community maybe has a few thousand fans, right? It's Kevin Kelly's thousand true fans concept. Look that up if you don't know about it. I mean, if you're actually getting paid by a thousand or two thousand true fans, you can make a living if they're paying you real money as opposed to you know streams. And when you look at what the streaming services provide, by the way, in terms of revenue, I mean that's a whole other topic, but it's abysmal. One Ethereum is about um, nine hundred thousand streams on today's exchange rate. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I just I don't know which we want to take the conversation, but it depends, I think, a little bit on the art form. But these are fascinating. Uh, times when I think some of the order is being remade in each of these art forms and it's not clear what's good and what's bad about that. Yeah, I would say that in addressing your, your question, and look at it ecologically. <clears throat> How does the NFT operate with artificial intelligence? How does it operate with virtual augmented reality, physio haptics? How does it operate with robotics, androids, mechs? back into the AI vertical, how's it operate with chatbots and smart assistants? As we all know, technologists, that technology abides within the eco habitat and you'll have artificial intelligence that may be flanked by machine learning and deep learning. And then you may have XR, acronym, extended reality, flanked by virtual and augmented reality. Robotics flanked by machine and mech and Android. But these technologies are emerging, but what happens when they begin to cross-pollinate with one another? On a morphous scale, we sometimes don't know what the manifestation of that will come out to be. And it's kind of what's, what leads to what we call technological convergence. It's these technologies have come together, they bind it. And so when you take, and here's, here's what's interesting. We accelerated, we, we know when it comes to technology, good technology is superseded by great technology. We all know about the hype cycle, you know, peak of inflated interest, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, plateau of uh, productivity. But we know about that. But usually that's spurred and spawned, as many can tell you here, that technology is superseded by great technology, which we commonly refer to as the disrupt. But never have we been in a time where the disruptor technology wasn't technology, but the disruptor technology was a pandemic. We've become more virtual in the past 24 months than we have the past 24 years. And now that it's been this time where product delivery teams and remote distribution has happened right from our living rooms and people have been ushered into, let's say the colloquial metaverse, if you will. Now that we're spending time in this space and people and C-suite on down and everyone in between are spending time in these spaces, content creators, developers, all kinds of folks, musicians and everyone, they're like, oh, now that we're doing this, now what ends up happening is they're saying, hmm, um, Rhonda, Tony, what else can we do in here besides communicate? Now we're migrating to what I kind of dubbed the animate economy where buy, sell, trade comes in. Well, here comes crypto assets because that's part of the habitat as well. You have crypto assets, which was spawned by, let's say, blockchain. And then we have NFTs and DAOs and decentralization. And a lot of platforms that we see that are dealing with NFTs natively in their environment when it comes to ownership, a lot of these were very utopian. When you take Decentraland, a lot of people said, yeah, that's great. That's a nice con conceptual virtual world. It, it will never come to pass because you would have to have more people to be able to support it. And, and right now, it's, not, it's never going to supersede fiat currencies and assets. Well, guess what? Now that we're more virtual, 
and people are more heavily into crypto assets, what I'm getting to is that we've been accelerated. We've accelerated the process. And with this acceleration, it's great. Yes, it's generating capital. By Q3 last year, we were at over $11 billion for NFTs. That's wild. Just $11 billion industry. By Q4, 20 plus billion, leading into 30 billion. Now we're here Q2. We're almost, we're almost getting ready to dance with $100 billion. Here, here's my point. There was a time where we said places like Silicon Valley or let's say Atlanta or Washington, Seattle, that a sooner once said that Silicon Valley is more advanced in technology than the United States government. And that was true then. But what happens when the technology becomes more advanced than the technologist? And here's my point. The regulation is a big deal when it comes to artist communities. I know fine artists, graphic artists, 3D artists that have benefited from this. I know fine artists, graphic artists, 3D artists, 3D artists hate it because of ownership. They lose autonomy, but others will have the self-same claim, I gain autonomy. So we have to iron this out. So graphic artist guilds, litigation attorneys, how do you regulate? How do you define? I, someone raised their hand in a meeting. And I'll be done with this in a second. Someone raised their hand in a conference that I spoke at, packed full of people of NFT interest. And they said, well, how do, you, how do you define ownership? To what legal and legality are you going to be able to operate? And how are you going to regulate that? Especially in the metaverse. Metaverse doesn't have any defining lines of, of <clears throat> geocentricity or location. So how are you going to regulate that? So my whole point in saying that is when we were at a point where what does it do for the artists in the community? The real answer is, and I think the honest answer, at least from my lens perspective, is I don't completely know. On a morphous scale, I don't know yet. I know what it is today, but when it comes to tomorrow, what we hope it to be is a sustainable platform so that musicians and artists alike can actually have a living and livable wage. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I think you touched on some things, Christopher, in terms of the kind of uniqueness and um, the uh, interaction with code in the future and where, where an NFT can go. Because it's not just a thing, but it's a thing that can connect to lots of different capabilities. I think Eddie was hinting at that too, is, you know, this is some next um, software entity that we are just starting to explore the capabilities of. So, you know, once the energy and around speculation and then the energy around creators just needing to get paid, once we get through those waves, where are we going to land when it starts interacting with a more fully functional AI powered metaverse and all these system services. I mean, what, what I'm seeing now is people in advertising, for example, thinking of the NFT as the next cookie, you know, the next way to identify somebody and understand what their needs wants are and they can opt in for that. So Eddie, I think you were hinting at some of that, um, where you're heading with NFTs. And I know you're a little more gamer centric, but I feel like you're thinking the same thing, right? There's more to the NFT than just the thing itself. Very much so. I see the Web3 space. It, look, history repeats itself. And we saw in Web1, we saw in the dot-com bubble that everyone thought that anything with a dot-com domain name was going to make them millionaires overnight. But the reality is very quickly do people realize just any website wasn't going to cut it. You needed utility for that website. That added a level of sophistication to the development of these websites themselves that not just anyone would be able to put them together. And that utility then made these platforms become the global leaders. We're seeing the same thing happening in the NFT space. Last year alone, anyone could throw an image up, make some money. But the reality is people aren't just buying NFTs purely based on the art world. Some are, but the reality is a lot of people are looking for the utility underneath the NFTs themselves. Owning this NFT, what does that grant me after the fact? Why should I hold this NFT after I've purchased it? And I see coming very much from the virtual reality world. The metaverse is the killer app that everyone's been waiting for, for virtual reality. You know, VR, I remember in the first few years when, when the, the, the sort of the Oculus Rift was still a Kickstarter project and people were only just hearing about what VR could do. There's a lot of naysayers about that technology as well. But sure enough, a few years later, you know, the, the Oculus Quest is now outselling the Xbox. So it takes a while for people to adopt this technology. But seeing how quickly NFTs are being adopted, it's something that I've never seen in the emerging tech space. 
And I think when you look at NFTs as almost your digital identity inside a Web3 world, or as I like to call it, a sort of a three-dimensional version of the internet, um, one where we've seen where the Web2 world has gone wrong with data ownership and, and lack of privacy, and then we're introducing this decentralized technology that allows you to effectively become the persona you want to be at any moment in time and jump into these online shared persistent spaces. I think that's a really, really powerful thing. So the NFT world at the moment, I mean, ultimately blockchain, I think NFTs are the Trojan horse that will get the masses to adopt blockchain that much faster. But ultimately, blockchain is just a back end technology. No one should really need to know whether it's Ethereum or Polygon or this or that or the other. They should just be able to turn up to a website with a credit card, do a thing that they're familiar with doing, and the blockchain is all happening on the back end. So we're getting to that level. Coinbase will probably be the first platform to integrate that well, um, and they will probably do some interesting things in the NFT space itself. But just looking at NFTs, not just as pretty JPEGs, but instead as, as, as pieces of technology and finding out how they can be used and how they can enrich content creators' lives. And ultimately, when we get past this, this art boom that we've seen, the art space very much disrupted by NFTs, I believe the next space is going to be the gaming world. Um, because kids are already so familiar with spending money on skins in game without realizing that's all a sunk cost. That's when those game publishers realize it's not worth running those games because the numbers aren't there. Having interoperability, all of these things that really should exist but presently don't exist because people can't miss what they don't know. But as soon as people are aware, this is how the technology can be used. So I think we're going to see a level of mass adoption unlike anything we've seen before. So it's, it's a fascinating world, um, and it's something that is evolving faster than any other emerging tech that I've had the pleasure of being a part in so far. Um, as Chris sort of alluded to, you know, we're hitting nearly $100 billion sort of trades on, on, on NFTs in the space of a few short months, and it took a long time for virtual reality to hit that sort of point. So yeah, it's, uh, again, it's a crazy world to look into, and every day you're getting more complexity added to these NFT projects that is turning them from just simple JPEGs into something that has much more tangible value outside of that. And I just, I really like this notion of you can, you can feel, you can be whoever you want to be on these, on these platforms by associating yourself with your favorite NFT character. And I think that will become a very powerful thing as people continue to move away from the distrust they have for Web2 platforms and realize Web3 is a, a better way of operating. And from the content creator side, ultimately it's the wallet to wallet relationship that, that any content creator, a content creator can now have with a community. They don't need to go through anyone. There's no middleman. There's no way that they, they have to jump through hoops or potentially not be able to get the exposure when they themselves can build that community and, and now have an interaction with them directly without that middleman, so to speak. So there's so many ways that this technology is going to flourish over the next few years. I think the art world is absolutely here and being disrupted. I think the music world is well on the way. And I think the game space is going to be another big space that we'll see. And as time goes on, we'll see more and more industries adopting this technology until it just it is the next internet and it's just here and it's everywhere. I think you bring up a, an interesting point and, and one couple points, one that I'd like to press back on a little bit. But uh, first, you know, the rise in NFTs did not happen, you know, in a silo, right? It's not, it, it happened because of their coupling with cryptocurrency and the rise in cryptocurrency and the bubble in cryptocurrency that preceded the NFT craze, right? So NFTs were a way for those who are invested in cryptocurrency to expand their market, expand what you can do with cryptocurrency. And, and our art just happened to be kind of like a catch, a catchy byproduct. So I, I think when we talk about NFTs, we also have to, we, we necessarily have to talk about what cryptocurrency is and how it functions. Um, and then the point, you know, that I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to be excited about a new technology and think about it, all of its possibilities, but we have to think about all of its possibilities, right? Why do people mistrust Web 2.0? What are the ways that we got the, writing the rules wrong, you know, because of this kind of, you know, ex excitement and kind of full steam ahead and, and failure to, to grapple and to absorb and to, to fully kind of take on the critique or the, you know, bring in the naysayers. Yeah. How are, what are all the ways this project can fail if it's successful? Right. And so I think as we're kind of moving into this brave new world, I do think, you know, some folks need to be fast and, and evangelize this, right? That's how things are going to move forward. But I think we also have to kind of embrace a, a slowness and a, a caution too, uh, as we think about ways to like regulate. Is, the, is, is regulation a bad thing? Are institutions bad things? Or in what ways do these, do these bodies protect other bodies? In what ways do these bodies hold memory? Um, and I think that 
those are really important questions as we move forward. Yeah, I think that's a really important point too, Rhonda. I mean, you know, right now we're still grappling with the idea, like we, um, I think Christopher brought up this idea of AI, but like we're talking about algorithmic bias and, you know, bias that comes with facial recognition and, and language processors, right? Natural language libraries. And that was a lot of that, you know, people, some of the naysayers in those areas are talking about, you know, moving so fast, should we do this? Like we never asked the question, should we? We just did it, right? And then could we do it better? And, and I think NFT and crypto, of course, has the same like potential to be eventually harmful as their, these technologies are adopted um, more widespread and by like governments and maybe some other organizations. So I wonder, my next question is about, and please for everyone who um, is in the audience, please put your questions in the Q and A and the next ones will definitely come from the audience. Um, but I'm wondering how responsible are um, creators and, you know, entrepreneur people who are, you know, um, making and promoting these things for the ethical implications of these. And that may be like, we spoke about the environmental um, uh, issue, the equity issue of who has access to these markets. Um, it could also be about the sustainability of them. I mean, these platforms could uh, disappear. I mean, who would be responsible for those type of things? So I think the question is, as a creator, as a promoter, how responsible are we are to those ethical implications and understanding that something is sustainable and maybe fair before we really engage in it? Well, I would say don't look to Silicon Valley for guidance on ethics and responsibility. The last 20 years or more have demonstrated that uh, at best, the industry is neutral about this. I'm being generous though, I think. Um, and I am personally concerned with the, I'm going to echo Rhonda a little bit with the pace at which some amount of decentralization is happening uh, that is reflecting an overall disintegration, vaporization of institutions worldwide at the moment. So while I love that the bonds of some of these more egregious platform plays of Web 2.0 are, are getting dissolved, I really fear you know, that they're not going to be replaced with anything that's necessarily wholesome. And vigilance is absolutely required. I wish I had an answer for what, the, what those things should be. I'm hoping that, for example, I mean, we've seen messes in DAOs. I mean, DAOs seem like so promising. And then you get into these giant clusters of internal politics and DAOs and toxic people, and there's no way to fix it. Um, and everyone's voting with their coin. Is that the way to do it? I mean, these are really deep issues that are completely intimately tied to all the wonderful platform goodness that Christopher and Eddie have been talking about for the last few minutes. These are all great ideas, but we may have totally uncorked it. Maybe a sorcerer's apprentice situation with this stuff. So I, I'm just, I wish I had more positive things to say, but I'm super fearful at this moment about where this could go. Ton, Maybe someone can pick absolutely. this up and flip the script a little bit so we can get a little more positive, but I am deeply concerned. Tony is absolutely right. And one of the things I look at is, and in, in it's really a, an important question uh, that was expressed. So, so thanks for sharing that. Um, when we talk about, you know, the regulation, you know, the responsibility, we're in the wild, wild west right now. Look, IEEE can't even catch up to this. I mean, they're having a difficult time trying to wrap their mind around defining what is the metaverse? What is, what are NFTs natively? Uh, Rhonda came out the park when we started talking about, you know, she brought it back to web two, you know, and I hear this word, oh gosh, floating around decentralization a lot. And I'm like, first off, a lot of these platforms that say they're all for decentralization, you're really a central platform, number yeah. one. And I hear a lot of people misusing metaverse, NFTs, um, decentralization. I see that John put in there that defining a DAO. Here's the point. I'm jump, let me get right to it right here because I have a couple of good examples here. I got Tony here. I got John here. Back to SVVR these days where they would go and have these great big setup meetings where they say, this is what VR is. Here's how you use it. This is, we were teaching people what this is. I learned a lot from SVDR. Here's Tony come out some months ago says, all right, here's the seven rules. I know that I came up with the seven standards of the metaverse. My point is, is saying this is that the technology is moving so fast, you're not going to stop it. None of us have the might and the power to stop. Rhonda, all of us collectively. What we can do together and, and individually is to help educate. 
see, this is why I put out the seven standards on the metaverse is dealing with humanity first standards, education, accessibility, wellness, equality, community development, safety, and privacy. What does that mean? In a very small nutshell is that we had better look at why we build these things for who we build these things for. Mm -hmm. And when Tony came out and with those seven, seven rules, it wasn't just, oh, yeah, here, let me define it. There's a lot of technologists that, that precede Tony. Um, he's one of the elders in here, in John and a bunch of others. And then and look at what things that Ed has done as well. My point is, is that the baton has been passed to us from the people that have built this technology. And we took this baton. And now it's in the hands of our generation to say, hey, 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 C-suite, all these people on down, like Rhonda said, this is some of the problems that we had in Web 2. Are we about to carry this over into Web 3? Because Web 3 is much more volatile. Okay. It's, and, it's, and it's much more rapid. And we're saying, well, it was one thing where we were just dealing with apps and gaming engines. We're dealing with the whole flourishing scale of technologies, plural. And they all operate with one another. And so I feel like the best way in addressing and answering your question specifically is, we have to become educators and teachers ethically, and we really kind of have to be the, those people that say, we don't have enough time to write regulations right now. It's moving so fast. We have to say, this is what it is. This is what we need to do. This is how we need to operate. But first and most important, define actually what it is and what was its original intent, and really c c considering those that natively built this and being respectful to, to them as well. We don't have the time and I think, you know, our current systems of governance would be absolutely incapable, you know, like just watching the Facebook, you know, the social media trials is like, oh my God, you know, there's, there's points where I watched, or was watching that with my students and talking about what we need is, you know, you folk, like we need to make governance like exciting and sexy. How do we bring like part of the like enthusiasm around like new technologies into, into the systems of governance that help regulate them, right? And I think, you know, maybe we can start looking to these models. You know, I think I, I put into the, the chat, this quote from Vankatesh Roy, he's talking about something else, but I, you know, this quote stuck with me. It's like, we're, we're kind of bringing our old, old mental models into these new technologies and like, oh, you're just doing X, you know, with the bell and whistle, right? But I think that there's also something else that's happening. Um, and I think, you know, Tony, when you get into these discourse with folks who are, who are super excited about the, the possibilities and the potential, I mean, part of that might just be, you know, naive youth, <laughs> but I think part of it is actually there is something that's happening that maybe, you know, our generations should steward to ensure that the next generation who's more prepared and their mental models are just different to kind of pick these things up. And I think, you know, if we can, if we can do that, <laughs> just like don't burn the thing down for just like a couple more generations, I think it, it, it's like these tools and these technologies could have really interesting and, and globally beneficial ramifications, right? So, yeah, thank you, Rhonda. Actually, can I pick up on that? Yeah, because you've, yeah. you've, you've talked me off the ledge a little bit right okay. now. <laughs> I, I went a little dark there for a minute, but it reminded me, I wanted to share another NFT story, which was um, uh, Ukraine Dow. Nadia Talakonikova, Pussy Riot, um, helped put together a Dow that bought an image of the Ukrainian flag as an NFT. They raised over $7 million in a week or two and gave it to Ukraine relief charities. Um, that was direct active, it was art and activism acting directly at a scale I don't think we've seen before, at the speed with which we've never seen before. And, you know, could you have done a GoFundMe or a Patreon? Yeah, but no, this was like, plug your wallet in, buy some, buy some Ethereum. It's going into this DAO and they're gonna buy this NFT. Amazing, right? Right. Well, and um, this, this is like also an example of that like distributed system of, of capital, but also distributed social system that Christopher is kind of talking about that yeah. that that is enacting goodness in, in the world. Right. As our, our our governments and our political bodies fail to keep up with the changing world and as they fail and, and create destabilized systems, how do how can we, you know, create 
essentially, you know, these secondary kind of distributed systems that, that might help, like, are they disruptive or are these actually potentially stabilizing systems? Um, and I, you know, it's to be seen, but I think, you know, if we have enough folks who understand the technology, but also have, you know, some of the, the issues that Christopher's, you know, uh, talking about at, at, at mind as well, then I, you know, I think we'll be better prepared to write better rules that we'll need, you know, and that's the hard part is, you know, not being able to anticipate the need. Um, but I also think that's where artists and, you know, writers and, and poets and philosophers who, who think very speculatively about the world can engage this conversation and think about what are these speculative outcomes? What are the, all of these possibilities? Yeah, I mean, NFTs and blockchain, ultimately, it's a tool. And tools can be used for good, tools can be used for evil. It really depends on, on what we want to do with it. And I think what is so fascinating about this space is content creators. You know, the age old saying that content is king. Having an emerging technology that's had so many skillful content creators flow into it so quickly is creating an abundance of good content, also bad content, um, that is now available for anyone to be able to access at the click of a button or connecting a wallet without needing to submit all of the private details that they may have to in the old world. So I think look, there are multiple unknown unknowns in front of us that we need to tackle, but I think it's down to, to basically everyone in the audience, everyone on the panel here, to dig in and find out what this is. And I think the best way to do that is just jumping in the deep end, figuring out what it is to mint, figuring out what a project is, what a DAO is. And you can read until you're blue in the face, but ultimately just taking part in any project will teach you a great deal about it. And that's why it's so important when you do look at a project, are the teams doxxed? Have these people in this world of anonymity revealed their identity to the public without the fear of backlash of ultimate regulation because they know what they're trying to do is for the betterment of technology and, and hopefully for the world? And I think these are all things that when you look at the NFT space, you can quickly get an understanding as to whether this could be an interesting use of technology or just a, a cash grab. Um, so yeah, I, I could probably rib it on about that for a lot more, but ultimately it's, it's a tool. And I think really you can use a tool well or you can use it badly. I'd say two quick things real quick to piggyback on something Ed said earlier about uh, the, the utility. Um, I kind of thought about Simon Sinek going back and Simon Sinek said, people don't buy products and services, they buy culture. And so we saw the people, people were like, oh, let me go and build an NFT. I can make money quick. But then that kind of fizzled out. And now we're starting to see the plat these, these NFT platforms verticalize. And here comes the culture. So Tom Brady comes out with autograph and says, yeah, here, you know, there's culture play in and buy in. And then, and then Rhonda just said about making it sexy. And it's like making, and, and for me, I've now dedicated my whole career with Gatherverse. We had over 10,000 people get together a couple months ago and really start talking about the metaverse. And then we're going to have, we have so many more events. We just announced an event today for the Latin summit um, for the Latin community. I mean, what does that look like in the metaverse and music? I know Tony will like that. I, I'm due to talk to him about this. He doesn't know it yet, but music, what is music in the metaverse? We have that event coming this summer, athletics in the metaverse. And then we have three, we, which is a web three summit that speaks on human sustainability for web three. And that's why we call it three, we, because we talk about web three, but three, we don't forget about the, we, the people. And so the, and, and it's for everyone, they're free events and all that. I'm not trying to do a shameless plug, but I'm finding how can I take what I've come to understand as a technologist and learn from all kinds of people that look like me, that don't look like me, that could come from different backgrounds and different environments. And how can I tell the people where I'm from, like Oakland and, and or Compton or Southside Chicago, how can I tell them about this technology that I learned from other people and technologists as well and share that. And, and at the same time, have my colleagues and peers come and share what, you know, I, so I really appreciate what Rhonda said. I, I think that's a, is super important. Thank you. Is there a question in the, the chat, Christine? I don't know if we want to try to tackle this, but I think it's an interesting question and one that actually hasn't really <laughs> been resolved. So beyond their value as investments, what are the technological benefits or implications of NFTs beyond the economics? What can you do with NFTs that you can't do with underlying digital artwork? So one of the things that you can do is... Um, write a smart contract, right? Which means that an artist can sell a, a digital piece of artwork. If it ever changes hands again, the smart contract is kind of built in to, to the object. Um, so there's kind of a, a legal precedent at, that if it resells, if the item resells on the secondary market, the artist can actually get 
uh, a bit of that money back, which historically has not been true, right? The Christie's of the world are not usually giving, <laughs> well, they're not usually selling living artists work first. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, even when they do that, you you know, the artists, uh, yeah, there's free, there's many, many cases of artists work being kind of held and then flipped and, you know, the artist sees none of that. So there's that. And I think that, you know, this is where we get into the smart contracts. And, and then the question is, well, does the, do we actually need to put the, the contract on the blockchain, right? Are there, are there ways that like, you know, when we talk about the ecological impact and the kind of computational inefficiencies, like, can we just write better artist contracts that don't necessarily need the encryption or, you know, if they're not living with the object, you know, if they're not actually the object in and of themselves, you know, um, maybe, maybe we can start thinking differently. Maybe NFTs just kind of move the needle for us to start thinking differently about ownership um, and about contracts. I mean, we can learn from that and kind of take it off, off the chain. I don't know what you all think about that. Well, A, we could fix the chains and that is coming. At least keep, people keep saying it. Ethereum 2 is still getting kicked down the road a little bit, but hopeful that that's happening this year, which would be a proof of uh, stake implementation of Ethereum. And John, if you have definitions handy to share in the chat for that stuff, yeah. Um, th that's like 99% less of the economic, uh, ecological uh, devastation with that kind of uh, set of algorithms. Um, then, you know, the environmental objections would go away. To your other question, I think really, because now we're not in a computationally, intentionally computationally expensive implementation. Um, in terms of, well, couldn't you just write better contracts? Well, Rhonda, who's going to write those contracts? The licensing people and the agents and the businesses that you're in already? I mean, the artists are taking the stuff right. into their own hands. I've got a couple of examples of, you know, continue on the answer to this question of musicians who've done things like offered fractional ownership of a master of one of their songs. So now the people who are buying the songs are also possibly participating in the back end of any music licensing, assuming that goes somewhere. Uh, they're offering swag and merch and other things in addition to the physical or, you know, uh, manifestation of the art in digital form, if you will, the MP3s or whatever. I'm using music examples. There are these in the visual arts, too. Or what Violetta, this woman I mentioned earlier, is doing is like if you own five of her NFTs in this one collection, any five, this is where the weird smart contract came in, um, you get tickets to her shows for life. So there is, an, it, is a fan relationship that, that's happening in music that is being enabled by these new pieces of technology. And again, that's just in music. I'm sure there are analogs and visual arts or other art forms that we haven't even gotten to yet. What happens when the film industry or book publishers move into this too? Um, so yeah, once you get code attached to this, it's beyond just the digital asset and even those backend royalties that Rhonda was mentioning. And I don't think we've even touched the possibilities, you know, hearkening back to what Christopher was saying. <laughs> Once you connect these up to AIs and the life cycle of what this could be for millennia to come, we don't know. I think so if you look at the growth of blockchain, um, proof of work, proof of history, proof of stake, proof of royalty, you're seeing a lot of different manifestations of the chain. I know that we've worked on an initiative five years ago with UC Santa Cruz on transferring the human genome on the human genome on distributor on a blockchain. You know, that's far wild beyond an NFT and a crypto asset, but going back to its native use of the blockchain is, is really is, is, is a piece of data timestamped to this very, very rudimentary form. And so how do we, how do we justify, you know, because listen, what Tony just said about Ukraine and what's happening to them and, and peace be with them. Well, with Ukraine, it's like, hey, they just raised a lot of money on a, I think they probably did it on Ethereum or I, I think, or proof of, a proof of work, let's assume. So it's like, it does good, but it's hurting the environment, but it's doing good. And so where do we go on the, on the moral imperative? I know that may be a bit Socratic, but how do we start to justify, you know, is it justifiable now to use proof of work now that we did it for the 15 million refugees that are now getting ready to exit and, and, and egress out of Ukraine? And, and, and a lot of those people, they're our colleagues. I, I know, probably, I almost, I'm sure some of, well, some of us have worked with people and folks in our community in Ukraine, these are technologists. And so how do we do that for sustaining and helping ourselves? Because the pandemic's still around, wars are here. We have to look at that and how that leverages in the eco-habitat too. So I think those are really important questions. One of the um, questions that a couple of people have updated is maybe related to this idea of like that Ukraine relief example that 
uh, has been mentioned. So are there major examples of nonprofit organizations that have benefited from the sale of NFTs? This, uh, the audience member knows of projects that have failed, such as the WWF UK Tokens for Nature. You know, we talked briefly about this Ukraine example, which might be a good one, but maybe there's other examples you can share with us. I mean, I'm always going to think of uh, Rare Pizzas. It was such an early project in the space and it achieved so much. And again, you've got to think the NFT landscape 15 months ago was a very, very different world to the one we live in now. This was pre board Apes. This is pre-generative collections. This was sort of, it was very early. It all started in a room about nothing on Clubhouse at the peak of the pandemic, a time when people were stuck at home, feeling lonely, no one to really talk to. And then applications like Clubhouse started getting popular. All of a sudden they can jump in and start talking to people, which I can't, if people are not familiar with Clubhouse, I look at it very much like a, a interactive radio. And the the whole notion of, hey, can we can we do something for the betterment of the world? Um, pizza, you know, it's a human right. It's a, it's a distribution problem, not a scarcity problem. So why not create a model where we can raise funds by selling digital artwork to people that those funds would then go towards purchasing real life food for real life people all over the world and leverage the community to onboard the local pizza shops to, to be able to, to bring this technology to your, your, your table effectively. So this was, again, it was just a really interesting use case that no one had probably anticipated this would become a, a way that you could work with NFTs, but ultimately a lot of people got fed pizza on May 22nd. Um, so again, it's there are so many ways that we just have no idea. The unknown unknowns need to be figured out. And as this space continues to mature, there's going to be so many groundbreaking implementations of NFTs being used in so many different ways that none of us here or now are going to be able to anticipate. And so it's just, yeah, the only way you're going to figure it out is by jumping in at the deep end and, and sort of seeing what comes next. So real quick to the essence of your question too, and this is what's, if there was something that scares me about what we do in this technology, love the example of pizza too. You know what scares me the most? You just said something that's very apropos. All these nonprofits, major nonprofits that are getting so much money to be able to spend and invest for humanitarian efforts. But here's the deal. They have to go, they're going to the experts to define what are NFTs and how do we use them? You know what scares me? That the wrong person is going to educate them mm -hmm. and, and they're getting bad information. I know I'm not the only one that sees it, but I see a lot of these companies out here that are, are speaking on the metaverse. And I'm like, where did you get that information? That's bad information you got. That's not the metaverse or that's not decentralization. That's the one thing that scares me because they're going to move off these so-called experts that are here telling them this is what, how, what NFTs are and this is how you use it. And I'm like, that's, that's not a good, that's not healthy. That's, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, not so much on the nonprofit, but we're seeing large sort of global brands moving into the space now. Yeah. And they yeah. are doing it in an extractive manner. You know, people sort of when when you're in the NFT world, you you great you take great pleasure not only in selling an NFT, but also in buying other people's NFTs and being able to support. It's it's a happy family that everyone comes up together with. But all of a sudden you'll get these mega corporations that have worldwide followings will come in and they'll they'll instead of dropping a collection of a few thousand NFTs, they'll drop sort of tens of thousands of NFTs for gargantuan amounts of money that they know will sell out simply due to the following that they had. And all of a sudden, that's tens of thousands of Ethereum out of the network going to shareholders in a Web2 capacity, not going back into a community of people who are passionate about building a better future. And this, I think, is also it's a big, big problem because ultimately people are, a lot of people are in here for, for to make some money. And it can't be denied. This is a, definitely some attraction to a lot of people in the space. But generally, the way I would look at it is if, if you're taking out, you should be putting back in tenfold. And if you do that, then you will be a success in the space. But we see too many of these old Web2 philosophies or companies now looking at this, this space as just a lot of free money just by doing a thing. And that, I think, is a, is a wrong way to look at this. And we so have some mechanism for taking those great bodies of wealth and redistributing it back to people. If there's only just some mechanism in place to do that. Be great. Somebody make a make a make a technology solve. I wonder if I wonder if he'll I wonder if he'll mint Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the, you know, I mean, like I joke around this kind of like, you know, reinvent the library, reinvent a Twitter, but it's like, well, what what parts are 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 actually meaningfully, you know, changed when when we kind of digitize them? And I think we don't we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need innovation. You know, the, we're we're facing global crises where you know I think we will need massively distributed but organized um, kind of calls for action. And I think you know we're we're modeling some really strange baby prototypes, 
Um, and I think John mentioned this, you know, we are in an awkward stage of, of the chain, right? It's, <laughs> it's, you know, growing too tall and has braces and, you know, it doesn't quite know what it is yet, but I think, you know, I think we will get there. And I think I'm, I'm blockchain positive, crypto wary, and I think minting at this point. <laughs> Yep. So there are two, there's a, a question in the chat about NFT breeding, asking how does it work? Is there a random characteristic generator that assembles a new NFT based on the combination of two NFTs? I'm wondering if that's something people here want to approach or is it something that we can answer um, in the chat? I think they might be talking about things like crypto kitties and that sort of thing, the generative art artwork where you, and the, the most, the first most famous example is crypto kitties where it was an NFT where you could um, buy a kitty and then um, breed them together and their attributes would combine in new and interesting ways to create new artworks. So you would, when the minting would, would create another kitty basically. And it kind of gets into, uh, an aspect of Web3 gaming where you can take two things and use them with complex uh, smart contracts to make a new thing or to, they don't, like I said, the NFTs are immutable. They don't change, but they can be elements that the smart contracts look at to create something new. Hmm. So they can be like input variables uh, to some code. So the breeding is really a function of the smart contract which is then empowered to create transactions on the blockchain um, on behalf of a wallet. And I don't know how else to say that. So somebody save me. <laughs> no, you did good. Uh, no, Ed, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say very much from a generative side. I mean, when you're when you're putting together a generative collection, effectively what you're doing is taking, I mean, there are many ways you can do it, but a good example is taking layers. You're effectively layering transparent PNGs on top of one another to have a different, unique image. Yeah, so, paper doll style, basically, right? Precisely. So effectively, you'll create maybe 200 different assets that can be combined in combinations to five to seven apiece, put on top of a base image, and that will create an entirely unique image. Now, having, I mean, just when you look at the sheer numbers of having 200 odd assets, that ends up in billions upon billions upon billions of potential outcomes. So effectively, there's a lot of QA to make sure you're getting the ones that look the best working together. But the whole idea of breeding is fascinating. And we've seen it done in quite a few projects, but ultimately it could just be a combination of different layers coming from both sort of parent NFTs themselves. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'll, I'll keep it relatively short, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun use case. That's good to know. Thank you. And maybe this is actually a good segue to promote uh something at San Jose State that Rhonda is planning for next term, which is, did you want to describe a little bit? It's going to help people understand more about how to actually mint and mint NFTs, right? Yeah. And so I think, you know, the, the discussion we just had, I think kind of alludes to, you know, there's still a human back there. Like you could run an AI generator and just, you know, produce, it's just, you know, a JPEG or, you know, if you wanted to make a movie that's, you know, computationally expensive, you can do that. So you can automate things. I, I put a link to a chat in the chat, Holly Herndon, who's a musician who, who has trained an AI like on her voice. And she's using that both in her records, but also minting uh, NFT. So you can purchase, you know, a generator of her voice and like produce music with her voice. Interesting questions around that. Um, Next semester, we'll be running a minting workshop. So kind of addressing some, you know, building on the, the work that John and Christina have, and everyone else who put this together uh, today, um, where students, I'll, I'll run them through like a, a few simple physics algorithms that they can use to either make a movie or a still image. And then we'll talk about, you know, lazy minting styles, which, you know, allow artists to put their works, you know, up on, on platforms, but not actually mint until point of sale. And so that's another way to kind of start addressing some of the ecological concerns as well. So we'll run through kind of start to finish uh, creating an NFT. And then hopefully, at, like, you know, I'm a big proponent as an artist of learning by doing, uh, like, when you write the code, you learn a lot about the ways that you can make better rules. Again, so let's let's do the thing and then think about ways that we, we wanna see, uh, write better rules for the future we wanna see. 
Absolutely. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists so much. It was a great conversation today. There are still some really interesting questions in the chat. And so if folks want to go in there and answer those, people can see their answer textually. And um, we just want to thank so much, everyone. This was great. And please know that we are going to be putting a link in the chat where you can go to our breakout Zoom session to explore uh, some virtual platforms, virtual worlds, well, NFTs, um, are exhibited and can be interacted with and, and why you might buy some uh, to use in these kind of platforms and metaverses. I also want to really going. invite the panelists if they have the time and interest to stay into the breakout session. I know, Ed, maybe you, you are going to have uh, you or an associate give a demo of your product, but if any of you want to stay, the, the breakout sessions are more traditional Zoom where we can open up the floor and have kind of more free-flowing discussion as long as everybody behaves themselves. And um, yes. I hope, you know, it'd be kind of like a, a nice relaxing uh, post, post uh, panel chat if you are interested. But I know some of you have tight schedules, so I understand if you can't stay. Um, I'm trying to juggle another call. If I can, if I can move my other call, I absolutely desperately want to give people a little demo of the the notorious frog world we call Frogland. So uh, give me a couple of minutes. Let me do some juggling, and I'll hop straight back in. Yeah, come in anytime. Thanks um, so much. I've, I'm, I've actually got to give an artist lecture at a, another class. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet the panel and you know grapple with these issues. It's great to get outside of my little echo chamber of <laughs> community minded folks. So great to hear what you all are doing. Thank you so much, everyone. And for everyone else, we will resume at 1.30, uh, but please join us in the breakout rooms or the breakout Zoom, I should say.